Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast, Four Do's and Don'ts of Building an Effective Upskilling Program, sponsored by Go One. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. You will receive an email from hr.com within two business days. It will include the certification credit information. You may also log in to hr.com and go to your View My Credits page, where you can see the credits that you will receive. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on Q&A in your webinar controls and type them in. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Carolyn Brandt. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Brandt. I wanted to say a quick hello on video, but then I'm going to turn it off so that I don't distract you while I look on different screens, um, but I am really looking forward to this webinar today. So let's get started. Okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I started 25 years ago as a technical writer at Learning Tree International. I then worked um, at ROI training and I developed the cloud platform program for Google and several other learning programs. Um, and then I switched to Zoomy, where I was focusing on measuring uh, effectiveness of learning and artificial intelligence. And now I'm at GoOne. I'm a consultant for the organization on digital content for enterprise customers. So a few of the companies that I have worked with over the years are on the screen. We don't need to really dig in too deep because I want to get moving. We have a full agenda today. I'm very excited to also have Brandon Carson, who's the Director of Learning at Delta Airlines, and Rachel Horwitz, who's the Director of Global Learning at Convitec. They will be here to answer questions throughout our webinar, so feel free to use the QA above to ask any questions. I also have some questions that were sent ahead of time that I will be throwing in there. And Brandon and Rachel will also be talking about upskilling that they're doing within their organizations. Oops. So today we're focusing on why upskilling your workforce matters. I will be discussing the impact of learning experience on learning engagement. We'll go through some do's and don'ts to effective upskilling, and then we'll definitely have time in the end for Q&A. Why upskilling your workforce matters. So there's a lot to talk about with upskilling. I think most of you know the definition, but I wanted to go over a couple of things, especially comparing reskilling to upskilling. So reskilling is the process of learning new skills so you can do a different job or training people to do different jobs. While upskilling points out to the same, it focuses more on improving worker skills so they can work within the same job more effectively. So clearly it's important because digital transformation is happening in every industry. The speed of change has increased, uh, new demands for skills are taking place. We need to do a better job of giving employees what they need to do their jobs and do them more effectively. Employees are completely unprepared right now. If you look at any survey right now about this, you'll see 70, 80, 90% um, of people say they are not they haven't mastered the skills they need for their jobs or they say they lack the skills they need for their current roles and their future careers. Gartner had um, the study above that is showing that 70% um, of employees said they haven't mastered the skills they need for the jobs today. People should be able to live, learn, work, and participate in the digital world. Um, you know, our jobs are changing and very quickly. Most roles are disappearing. Um, new ones are springing up. There's a discrepancy between the skills people have had in the past for certain roles and now they need for the same roles in the digital world. And it's a very critical uh, situation. So costly turnover, this is not shocking at all. Um, and some of these are pretty conservative figures, I think. Um, for every dollar spent on upskilling, businesses typically earn or save um, two dollars. So, you know, that's a pretty good return. And this is according to PwC. At the end of this presentation, I have a couple of links that we'll be distributing, and there's a great video about upskilling by PwC. I thought about showing it today, but I think it's better if you watch it on your own time. Um, so, you know, we have to make sure that we are alerting our, our organizations to the importance of upskilling. 60% um, of US employers have job openings that stay vacant for you know, three or four months. Um, and we all know that sometimes it's even longer. Some HR managers say job vacancies cost companies more than a million dollars annually. 
Um, there are a lot of organizations who are committing significant investments in upskilling. Amazon, which is another link we'll show later, um, has announced that they're committing over $700 million to their 2025 upskilling program, definitely worth reading um, about, and the link will be provided. Um, PwC are committing over $3 billion to upskilling. Um, they're investing these funds in training their staff and also in technologies for supporting their clients in different communities. So there were a couple of questions, and Brandon, I'm going to throw one to you first. Um, one was, um, what is the best time frame, time frame for upskilling that sticks? So before we get into who needs it, Brandon, do you have any suggestions for when is an appropriate time to start an upskilling program, or does that not even matter? Well, it, it's a good question, and it, it really matters uh, on what the business outcomes are needed and what the constraints of the workforce are. If you, we're, we're in a pivotal situation right now when you think about it in L&D because to Caroline's point, the business is changing pretty rapidly, especially if you look at the airline industry, ours is changing very rapidly based on consumer expectations and based on technology uh, evolving so quickly. So if you don't upskill or reskill quick enough, you could constrain your business outcomes and you could cause your business to not be as competitive in the markets that they operate in. However, if you do it too rapidly, you can cause confusion and chaos in your workforce. So you have to find that, that, that uh, kind of how it works for your situation and your organization and what different skill sets are required. But you must have this in your learning strategy now because there's no company that's going to remain free of the digital age, right? So this is evolving the business, every business out there. And I'll, I'll tell you now, I've, I've stopped using the term knowledge worker, Caroline, because every worker at every level will be interacting with technology in some manner or form yeah. to get their job done as we go forward, right? So I think you've definitely got to have um, this as part of your strategic effort in HR and in learning. It just really matters what your business outcomes are. And that's where it's, it's really uh, important for you to align to those outcomes uh, what your learning strategy should be. That's great. So Rhonda, I hope that answered your question. If not, feel free to follow up in the QA. We'll try to get it answered more sufficiently. Um, so, so who needs upskilling? I mean, Everybody needs upskilling. There's no one who can't learn something to do their role better. Um, so every employee, every group of employees. But it's interesting, you have to make sure you're not neglecting your experienced workers, managers, and senior leaders. Just because they've been there for a long time doesn't mean that they're doing their job most effectively, especially when it comes to technology. So, um, you know, you also can't assume that the new and younger workers don't need technical skills. It's possible that they may be really great with certain technologies, but they don't know the technology being utilized within your organization. So as new technology is rolled out constantly, you have to address it across all levels um, from experienced workers, managers, senior leaders, and also to new hires and younger workers to make sure everyone has um, the, the newest technology skills they need to be successful. Um, and actually, Rachel, I'm gonna throw a question at you too. Um, Andrea asked, what should be included in an upskilling program? So, you know, when you're thinking about upskilling, who are you looking at to, to serve? I mean, who should be part of this upskilling program? Um, it's a really good question, and to Brandon's point, it really needs to align with the goals and objectives of the organization. Um, so, for example, if they, if the organization is looking to go through a digital transformation, and they've designed um, and defined what digital transformation means, then your upskilling would be aligned to that, whether it's building data building data analysis skills, um, upskilling in agile workforce, um, things like that. But I think it really depends on, um, as with any training program, um, what the, the company is looking to achieve and make sure the upskilling meets those specific needs. Again, um, it could be for everybody. Um, some people may just need upskilling to know about or where to get some information That's on what you're trying to accomplish. And some people need to know how to do. 
Um, especially, um, for example, if you take uh, data science that, that's been thrown around everywhere, and if you really take a step back and think when you're looking to upskill, who needs to really be data scientists and what do they need to be able to do? And who just needs to know when to go to a data scientist, what to use a data scientist for, how to partner and collaborate. Um, so again, it's really getting down to those learning objectives and what each of the target audience members need to upskill themselves. That is a perfect segue to our next um, section. So everyone has seen this. If not, it's one of my favorite quotes. The only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training them and having them stay. Um, and I think especially in organizations that have low turnover, that's very obvious throughout the organization when there have been people there for such a long time and they haven't been trained effectively, it's, it would be better to have someone new with good training. So train your people, it's really important. So where do you begin with upskilling? So you need to ask some important questions and Rachel alluded to a lot of these when she spoke recently. So why, why are, what are you trying to accomplish with your upskilling? Why are you training these people and, and who? Who are you trying to train and why are you trying to train them and how? And I thought that was a really good statement, Rachel, saying that you might need to train someone in data science, but you also might just need to train them on when and whom to contact for that type of information. Um, you know, do you segment the population? You need to identify these target groups. Um, it can change in different organizations by role, by operating unit, by country. Um, so Brandon, I wanted to, to have you participate in this section a little bit. So how did you determine who to set, how to segment? You know, what, what questions are you asking to help determine what populations you're training? Oop, Brandon, are you muted? Okay, we'll keep going. So, and then, and how? You know, determine the delivery method for your best learning experience and optimal learning engagement. We'll try to get back to Brandon if he comes back on. So there are some do's and don'ts that we wanted to go over, um, you know, do create a curated content library to best facilitate your upskilling. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, you don't want to make training difficult to access. Um, you can't just throw training at people and not offer them hands-on experience. And, and hopefully Brandon will be able to talk about this. Um, and as he talks about his program at the Leader Academy at Delta. And also remember that time is one of the biggest barriers to learning. And um, you know, I'm sure every single person on this call struggles with uh, making time for training and, and making their team feel like training is a priority. Oh, Brandon's back. Hey, Brandon, we lost you for a second there. Sorry about that, I don't know what happened. I could hear you perfectly. Nope, it's totally fine. So let's go back real quick because I liked that question. So um, I'm not sure if you heard it. H when you segment who you are upskilling, how are you determining how to segment? Is it in at Delta? Is it by operating unit? Is it by role? Or have you done it in different ways? Uh, good question. It is by uh, operating unit and then by role. So we are you know, we have different levels of criticality based on the roles that people perform. And as we're rapidly evolving the certain uh, operations that we engage in, we're having to do a lot of uh, role-based program or role-based uh, learning, if you will. So really kind of cutting it more surgically, if you will. Uh, we have a, a, a low attrition rate for our employees. And so we have uh, multiple generations working together, multiple levels of tenure working together as well, right? So we'll have some new folks come, just been there maybe a year or two versus folks who've been there 40 years, right? And so uh, as the work operation changes, we're having to reskill folks to, to, you know, understand kind of how to do what they do. So for example, we have this, um, we, in our app, you can track your bag through your flight, right? So from your uh, take off to your destination, we'll tell you where your bag is. Well, that happens because we've integrated technology into the entire travel ribbon, right? And so your bag is scanned at a certain point, and then we follow it uh, along and give you uh, indicators of where it's at, right? Well, to do that, we have to train the people that are handling your bags, right? And so this is a typical 
type of worker who is doing a manual job of moving your bag from where you drop it off in the lobby or at the gate uh, onto the plane and then deplaning it, right? So, but to do that, we've had to integrate technology into their work stream and we've had to train them on how to uh, operate that technology. And so, so that's not necessarily a compliance related operation, but it's what customers expect uh, through their travel ribbon. But there's also some compliance related activities that we're having to uh, reskill folks on as well. So the next five to 10 years in this industry is going to be one of constant change because consumer expectations have shifted. So we're in continuous learning mode, if you will, but we really look at it operationally from the role you perform. Um, That's great. So, um, so we'll keep going with the do's and don'ts. So starting with curated content leading uh, libraries that are needed to facilitate upscaling. So before you think I'm going to start selling you Go One digital content, I actually think one of the first things you should be doing in your organization is look for what you already have. So you should identify your learning channels. Is it going to be instructor-led? Are you going to offer coaching? Will there be on-the-job learning? Will there be follow-up e-learning? But then also audit your channels. What do you want and what do you have? It's possible you have much of what you need. It's just spread throughout your organization or in different operating units or in different segments of your organization. So reach out to colleagues to find course content. Um, you need to identify subject matter experts. You know, maybe they could teach a live class or provide a video. YouTube, as we know, is a great source for content. Um, so find those subject matter experts who can um, help with your upskilling and start to identify the gaps in both technology and content so that you can prioritize your access to budget and additional resources. So, you know, learning audit is sort of a, a phrase I coined. Um, it just basically means look at what you have within the organization. There much, there might, there's likely much more than you realize um, and make sure it's good content um, and then start to figure out what you're going to need to get. So um, personalize with, with small curated content libraries. So um, you, if you have access to 60,000 courses in a library, that's not going to do anyone any good if they need to quickly log in and take the courses that they need to be successful. So you need to have a small curated content library to make it super easy for people to access the training that they need. So, you know, make sure you create that library to facilitate the upskilling. Um, make it highly relevant so that your um, learning engagement is high. Um, have a library for each targeted group. Um, you know, Brandon's going to talk about that at the Leader Academy too. Um, you need to identify the end result for sure and understand your workforce's demographics to create a library for each target group. Um, Speak to different learners um, you know, make sure the library has flexible types of content. Some people prefer a quick micro learning or need um, additional training on a concept. Others might need longer courses, seminar based, web, webcasts, um, podcasts um, that, to learn a new concept and then have follow on training. So there needs to be a combination of the two dependent on what people, uh, how people need to learn. You also need to make it easy. That is a huge thing you need to prioritize prioritize the ease of use. If your employees need to um, click five different links to get to where they need to be and log into two different platforms, your engagement, you'll be lucky to get 0.01%. So, you know, definitely make sure that you, um, you pay attention to ease of use. Um, when you're running a pilot, you need to set clear goals so that you can set yourself up to be success successful and um, what problem are you sol solving continue to ask yourself that throughout the creation of your program decide on the length of time will it be three weeks six weeks six months um, and definitely choose a small testing group with varying roles um, develop an onboarding plan and determine a plan to collect feedback because analysis is really important you can't learn anything if you don't look at the results both engagement and how people um, did on their performance assessments or you know, any, you need to figure out what you're trying to analyze and um, make sure you're looking at the results. 
So again, don't neglect the learning experience by making training difficult to use. That I can't stress that enough. I've been in many organizations where you give up before you even get started because it's just too difficult to get in there. So is your content good? Um, is it from 2012? That's probably not a good sign. So make sure that you are continually curating new content, at least annually. Um, you know, it's easy to neglect libraries, but like I said before, just because you have a lot of courses doesn't mean they're very good. So make sure you have access to good content. Um, you may want to do pre-assessments and surveys. It can range from um, you know, a few questions, um, even to a test, and you might even need people to upskill before they start upskilling. Um, you might need to um, give them pre-learning ahead of time. And then definitely you need to monitor your technology for metrics, watching for things like low start, right, low start rates. So are people making time for training? What is your culture telling them? Um, is there high drop off? That's the first sign of really bad content. So make sure you're looking for, for those simple things as well. And complicated isn't better. Um, you know, Again, don't make it difficult to access, and it doesn't have to be a complicated course, and it can, it can be a simple concept that you're trying to get through to people. It could be five minutes that can really change uh, how people are working. So here's a question for the audience, and you can answer it in the chat. How have organizations you've worked for fallen short with upskilling? And while we're looking for some answers there, I'm going to ask Rachel another question. So have you done um, pre-assessments for your upskilling? Um, and how have you done that? And were you able to track um, that against the, the upskilling programs? Yeah, that's a really good question. And as I mentioned um, a couple minutes ago around data scientists, we invested in an online uh, data scientist program. And um, it was actually a learning, a learning journey. So there was um, something that was more for entry level data scientists who didn't know anything about it. And then those who um, had the cape in their closet and were data scientists on the weekends. Um, and we did pre-assessments to determine where their starting point would be. And then we helped to build their learning journey along with them based on those pre-assessments. So the feedback from the pre-assessments would come back. We would have a conversation with the employee based on um, what the assessment said and determine which starting point, midpoint, or towards the more ex um, experienced point they should start on their learning journey. And then um, the way that the program was built is there would be uh, multiple touch points along their learning experience. So we could test and see how quickly they were accelerating their learning. And um, we actually found in this, a couple people um, started at the beginners, um, went through the program, really accelerated their learning and were able to move quickly into the more experienced or expert level data scientist program. We also found that others decided to take a step back and um, take some of the prerequisites so they could get um, build some baseline familiarity before moving back into the learning journey themselves. So it really gave us um, some good indication about how we were, um, where we were placing employees, how they were progressing, and then how they could apply to their work. Okay, that's great. And just a quick reminder, don't put your questions in the chat, put them in the QA that's at the top of the Zoom screen. That way they're recorded and people can see them after the fact. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but I'm gonna stick to the Q&A for now. Feel free to retype them into the Q&A. So um, several people are commenting that they have no upskilling in the organization or their industry as a whole is not doing well with upskilling. Um, so, so Robin asked, can we talk about measurement and how you can demonstrate success or know when you need to course correct? And that's a pretty broad question, Brandon, but any comments on that? It's a good one. We're trying to apply uh, a scorecard to our learning organization, quite frankly, that isn't for us internally as learning people, but really trying to measure the impact of the programs that we get involved with on the business itself, right, and on the workforce. And we have varying levels of success with that. We're trying to do that in our leader development program now. So we've got certain dimensions that we're, we're looking at. Um, to, to measure the success of the leader development program, which is a little bit of fuzzy math in a lot of ways. 
uh, anyway when it comes to uh, central leader behaviors, but we are looking at retention. We are looking at our employee uh, annual survey that we do uh, as it applies to their leadership. We're also looking at the quarterly pulse, uh, all the employees in the company and getting that kind of feedback on their leaders and how their leaders are, are doing. Um, but we're also doing uh, a, a little different program in the leader development space in that we're providing our first level leaders who are the first cohort in this program we're working on uh, one on one coaching and through the coaching we're working with them interactively and individually to help develop their capacities and so we're doing the the uh, sort of personalized assessment if you will coming in we assess them we do uh, an assessment of them, and then we work with them as we coach them through the program, which is a kind of an MBA-like program as they can go through it. So the combination of that individual coaching and feedback that we're providing through the program, and also the measures that we're looking at from their leadership capabilities and capacity uh, from the folks that work directly with them and for them, gives us a little bit of indication, you know, of how well we're doing. And and then, of course, there's always the activity part of it, too, because it's a, a long program we're working on. So, so we're looking at the activity itself. Are they even coming to the program and, and engaging in the program and participating in it? That's important. It's an important metric, because if you don't engage and participate, then all the other uh, measures we have aren't going to really apply. So we're doing that in that particular situation. But we also are now moving towards a qualification a uh, model in our training for our operational workers, our ground workers that are working around the aircraft. Uh, we're qualifying specific tasks that they have to do. And with that qualification comes a pretty exhaustive proctoring of them. And so when you look at 15 to 20,000 frontline workers that we're qualifying uh, to be able to, to have them demonstrate that they actually can do the tasks at hand by showing us uh, through experiential OJT that they can do it. That's really showing us um, kind of a heat map, if you will, of our organization and its capabilities. So we're finding that those types of measurement strategies, there's not one overall measurement strategy for every role that we support. We're having to really hyper-individualize uh, how we look at the different roles and what their outcomes need to be. And then we're defining the measures that will give us the most accurate and dense quality data, if you will, to show us where the performance gaps really are. That's great. So, and it's interesting, some of the, the QA uh, answers, here's one from Jake that I find fascinating. At a large nonprofit, we were given access to an online library of training offerings, but weren't given time to pursue them. So basically they were, you know, expected to do upskilling on personal time, which re really devalue the whole experience. And I think that's very common um, and definitely one of my don'ts. I mean, we, you really do need to make sure that your staff has dedicated time um, at work to be training. Um, you can't expect them to do um, all of their mandatory upskilling or even, even if it's not mandatory, if it's job related upskilling, you, that's really on work time. You can give them access to the library for personal growth and taking courses on their own, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But Jake, I definitely think that you're right. It does devalue the whole experience. Um, other people have commented that um, Upskilling has been reserved for high potential employees instead of options for everyone. Some have outdated libraries as far back as 2010, which is a major issue. Um, and also line managers buy-in. So the programs um, are embraced by the employees, but the line managers aren't embracing it. So it's a it causes a lot of friction, I'm sure. Um, and some are not doing any upskilling or say they have terrible upskilling. Um, so don't just educate, offer hands-on experience. So people really do learn by doing. Um, this is an old, old chart that I'm sure you've seen before, but you know, people will forget if, what they've learned if they don't apply it to their jobs and soon. So it's called the forgetting curve. Um, they say two days after learning, almost 75% of the information will be forgotten if not applied. And honestly, for me, it's about 15 minutes. Um, so I need to be learning in the flow of work, practicing what I'm doing almost immediately, or I have to go back and start all over again 
in the learning process. So it wastes time, money, effort, um, and you're also bored and less engaged if you're not feeling like what you're learning can be applicable to what you're doing Im imminently. Um, any upskilling program needs to have a good balanced mix of education and active hands-on training where you can actually apply um, the new knowledge that you've gained by doing it at the job. So Rachel, um, if you could take a few minutes to talk about upskilling at Convitech. Um, I was going to speak a little bit about it, but I think it would be better coming from you in the essence of time. So just a little bit about the program that you did most recently would be great. Sure, no problem. Um, just really quickly, Convitech is a global medical device company. We specialize in advanced wound care, um, ostomy, and catheter products, just to put some context. Um, and we, in the um, past eight months, have set up a new line manager program um, to actually handle a lot of what Carolyn just mentioned. So we had a line manager program that was three days come out of the office, come into the classroom, go for three days, and then you're, you're back on the job. Um, we realized that while the content was good, the delivery and the application was not as effective. So we actually have now translated that into a nine month program where there, um, the, panel, the participants are participate in virtual learning um, once a month, focus on specific core competencies and learning modules to help develop those competencies, where then they can go and apply them directly on the job. And then they're asked to report back the next month, what happened, how did it work, what was successful, what was not successful, and we have a, com a conversation. They build on that so that when they come into the classroom um, for a shortened period of time, it is really to go deeper into that competency and capability development that they've already started, and then to be able to leave with a clear action plan to be able to apply on the job. So um, it, it, it is a program that is, myth, is a mixture of blended learning, um, definitely full of application, full of opportunities to um, take what they learned, try it out, test it, make some mistakes, come back in a safe environment, and um, also to learn with others, through others, in a virtual and face-to-face -face environment. Okay, that's great. So then, um, Brandon, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, the Leader Academy. Um, I have, just so you know, I have a slide that shows this. Um, I can mm -hmm. put that up if that will help you, yeah, but I thought great. it might help if you introduce um, the program in general and what you want to share about that. Yes. Yeah, so in our, in our uh, division at Delta, so just to give a quickie on this, uh, our division supports all of the uh, Delta employees that work in our 350 airports in which we operate around the world. So other divisions within Delta handle other audiences like the pilots and the uh, flight attendants and things like that. We support the airport workers. And so there's um, definitely someone in Q&A posted about line managers and time for training. So there's definitely a friction in the operation that we support when it comes to training time or being able to devote time to training because we have a very constrained labor model and we have a very constrained uh, time that's dedicated. Our staffing model actually does not dedicate training time to our workers beyond their new heart orientation. So any training that we do that's beyond regulatory or mandated training by the FAA is training that we have to convince people they should take. So, so it does put an extra onus on us to really want to drive participation and motivation through what we offer. Uh, but we did see a deficit in our leader behaviors uh, year over year and decided that we really needed to have a comprehensive leader development program for this division. We didn't have one before this. We were, were similar to Rachel, and we have very, uh, a lot of similarities in our programs, but we, were, we had a similar situation to Convitech where we would maybe do every now and then a one or two day offsite where we'd have guest speakers come in or even some of our senior leaders and talk about leadership and then everyone went back to work. But with this, we wanted to uh, design a program that did a couple of things. One, it, it has affordance for how people work. So it is not real possible to take 
thousands of workers out of the operation and bring them to multi-day classes in Atlanta that doesn't work. And especially when you look at this, the level of leadership, the first level leader and on up that we want to bring in for leader development, they can't really leave the operation for too much, too long at a time. So we needed to design this experience to have affordance for that, right? So how do we do, to Caroline's point earlier, how do we build in the design to allow some in the flow or near the flow of work learning as well? So we've got a really blend, we've got a strong blend to this model. So we do have some live class, but what we've done is we've modeled the whole program like an MBA program, if you will. It's a 15 month program. Uh, you come into the Leader Academy, you do come to Atlanta uh, for 10 days, but those 10 days are interspersed throughout the 15 months. So we do have some live classroom uh, training that you come to Atlanta for, um, but we also have a lot of virtual, like what we're doing right now using Zoom technology. We have virtual classes that people dial into while they're on their lunch break or right before their shift or after their shift. Uh, we have a good mix of e-learning components, but we've constructed the e-learning to be, uh, we're using Articulate Rise and it's all accessible on their iPhones and they can scroll through it. And it's uh, not any more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time that they go through the e-learning courses. And then similar to Rachel's design as well, we have action learning where there's an opportunity for our leaders to practice what they learn uh, in the live classes, the Zoom classes and the e-learning with their actual workforce. So the, the program has been going on about a year now. We're taking our first level leader through it and all of our leaders through it. And quite frankly, we're, we're getting some data back that's showing us the efficacy of this type of framework. And, and it's, a, it's a hit and miss to be totally honest with you. The live classes are great and people love coming together and sharing with each other because they're coming from all over the world. So they love getting in a room together. Quite frankly, there's nothing better than that face-to-face -face, uh, and sharing with each other what their challenges are and, and going back and forth with our coaches and facilitators. Uh, they get Once they get back into work, into the operation, it's a struggle. As you can see, it's a str in this, this map we have here, this course map. It's a struggle to get them to engage on our platform. We have a platform that we put together uh, specifically for this program that they can access through their iPhone or their iPad. Um, but once they go back to work, it's really a challenge. Um, we did curate some specific content from Go One that would that's augmented content for this experience. And quite frankly, we're finding quite a bit of an uptick in accessing that content more than we thought we would. So there are some bright spots in there, but what we're having to do is just do constant reminders for people of where they are in the program and where they need to be to succeed. Uh, once they engage and, motiv and are motivated to participate, it goes really well, but we do have some cultural challenges in that we don't have a lot of affordance for uh, training time. So folks are having to do this when they can find the time. Uh, we can't make it required, so we have to, uh, really have great content and a good experience to motivate them to want to come on and do it. Um, so we're, we're about halfway through our first couple of groups. Uh, feedback is great and it looks like it's really ha having an impact when we do our measurement, but the challenge is just keeping people engaged across this type of program, which we knew we'd run into. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so like we talked before, do remember that time is one of the biggest barriers to learning. So, um, you know, make sure employees are able to carve out time and you need to rely on your managers to make sure they're creating a culture of learning, making it clear to teams that training is required and part of the job and should be done on job time. Um, it shouldn't be done on employees' own time. Be proactive in checking that people are accessing training. And if they aren't, you need to reach out to them or have someone on your team in charge of reaching out. Hey, Joe, why aren't you taking training? How can I help support you? Um, and maybe speak to their manager as well. Um, make sure that workloads um, allow time for training. It may need to be scheduled, like a meeting. Um, it's like you have to schedule exercise anymore. You need to schedule training as well. I put it right on my calendar. Um, you also need to highlight the personal benefits of acquiring new skills and positioning them for 
not just professional growth, but where they may end up within your organization if they keep their skills um, the best they possibly can. So there's also a benefit to training when you can offer training unrelated to specific roles and skills. So we get asked a lot, almost in every conversation lately, for stress management and mindfulness training. And when you think about what's going on in the world right now, <laughs> it actually should be a requirement um, to prevent burnout and, and curtail turnover for sure. Um, you know, technology training that people are pretty solid on, but you can always do better how you're using, utilizing G Suite or Slack or other productivity applications. Applications, um, really important, and also time management skills. Even the best, most organized people could use assistance with time management. It can only help ease stress and increase productivity. So you know, this is training that they can do on their own time, but you may want to also consider offering that on work time as well. Caroline, can I just so, jump in real quick? Sure. Sorry, do you mind? Um, so I'm sure a lot of you right now within your organizations are having a lot of discussion around our current health issues. And um, I just want to throw in that our company is, um, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have people working from home. We're going to have salespeople that aren't able to do their jobs. So this is actually a time that we're going to be encouraging upskilling and learning and virtual training from home. Um, so we plan to curate some content to be able to put out to our employees now that they quote, may have some more time on their hands, assuming they stay healthy, of course. But um, this is an opportunity that we're going to be looking into to encourage the upskilling and training. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, and that's sure actually brilliant. I, there are, when travel, plan, well, you know, Rachel's able to be on this webinar today because her travel plans changed. Um, and I almost wasn't able to be on it because my entire family is now working or schooling from high school to college. They're now all home. Um, online learning here together. We're all online today. Um, I'm excited that our Wi-Fi is strong enough. Um, so yeah, it, there might be some additional um, time right now for people to be focusing on upscaling. I think that's a really good use of time as we're in this flux of, of travel changes and um, focus changes. So that's a really good comment. Thanks, Rachel. So here's another question for the audience. Um, what content would you like to consume that is not mandatory? Any questions there? And while I look for those, I mean, any answers there? While we wait for those, we'll start talking a little bit about learning and the flow of work. So you know, everyone I'm sure has heard of Josh Burson. Definitely worth um, looking into some articles that I have posted in the sources on the left. Um, clearly there's not enough time available for learning. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you are delivering learning in an environment where conversations can happen around it. Um, and also, are you spacing it? Is there repetition? How are you practicing this learning? And are there competency-driven recommendations? Um, so basically, at the end, I wanted to just point out that there are so much, um, it's, there's so many things at stake when it's um, with regard to upskilling. Make sure you have small curated content libraries. They are clearly the key to um, your success. Keep content fresh and easy to access. Uh, Hands-on practical experience is crucial. And make sure you're incentivizing training with courses unrelated to specific roles. And like Rachel said, take advantage of opportunities to um, encourage upskilling time uh, as things are shifting, especially right now. It might be a good thing to take back to your organizations. So with that, um, I wanted to open it up to Q&As if there are any specific questions. Um, Rachel, there was one um, in here that I thought might be pertinent for you. Um, how do you put together training and encourage it at the director level? So, you know, people who are too busy for work and have been there for 20 years doing their, their jobs, how do you target that group? That is actually encourage a really, them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good question. I literally was having that conversation yesterday. Um, because as Callan said earlier, uh, oftentimes we forget about the director or VP group and we assume that they already know everything or again, that they've been in the company 20 years and don't need to know everything. So there's a couple things that I think about is um, engaging them in the learning programs for others in different ways. So whether they act as coaches and mentors or facilitators to get them starting to think about learning again and um, knowing that they're helping others. And then simultaneously, 
this is when you can help to upskill them according to some of the company's strategic business objectives. So, you know, at any point, really, people do want to learn. So it has to be something that will, they'll, you know, what's in it for me? Um, and if they feel that it's something that will um, meet a need that they are looking to develop, will help them um, understand the, the company better and contribute to the company better. Um, that's something that may um, really reach into what their needs and desires are to develop. Um, but also it is getting them involved in other ways with other learning pieces of learning throughout the organization. And, and another, and on that too, is it, when you have a less engaged workforce, someone actually asked a question calling their workforce very introverted, and she's struggling with um, encouraging them to work through it and engage more in learning sessions. Um, do you have any suggestions for engaging that type of environment? Well, actually, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I don't have the magic ball to everything, but um, using technology might be a really nice way to do that. That's one of my first thoughts, because if they're quote introverted or they don't necessarily want to go to a classroom, using technology and having people engage on chat typically helps um, people engage who may not always feel comfortable because it creates that safe environment. So if people are able to um, communicate via chat, they're able to think a little bit before they post their answer. Um, they're able to read some other people's comments before they, um, before they review or comment on somebody else's. So thinking about bringing together, this is a rather, rather large group, we have 125 participants, but bringing together small groups of people for learning virtually might be a way to do that. Um, similarly, uh, again, using others in more of a coaching or one-on-one -on -one or small group mentoring sessions mm -hmm. may be another way um, to bring out some of that introvertedness and get people talking, again, because it's creating that safe environment with people that they may feel comfortable with. Lunch yeah. and learning. I definitely agree that. with that and, and utilizing the subject matter experts as mentors. Um, I mm -hmm. think that really opens everyone up to, to be more engaging. Um, I think that's an excellent um, suggestion. And, and clearly too, it, it goes back to hands-on learning and making sure that you can apply what you're learning to your job and are having some hands-on exercises to help draw those introverted um, employees out and get them doing their jobs. Um, yeah. while they're learning. So learning in the flow of work is important there too. Um, another uh, question was, and, and you know, we're really not able to answer this fully, but I'll touch on it. Are employees required to pay for time spent on job related, but not job required? Learning that employees choose on their own initiative. I think, and Rachel, I'll have you answer this too, but to me, I think that's between you and your manager, um, you know, the employee and the manager. There may be opportunities to learn something that's not mandatory, but will still benefit you in your role. So I think that's a conversation you need to approach with um, with the employee or the or the manager to see if what is appropriate. Do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. It definitely starts with that com that conversation with the employer and the manager. Then ultimately, of course, human resources to determine what um, are the setups for both um, the state and company um, policies that have been set up for this type of training. Yeah, that's great. So that's all I have today. Kathy, I'm going to throw it back to you. Um, she, Kathy's going to post a couple of links to a PwC video. I believe it's about 10 minutes. Um, I think it's great, especially the first minute is very engaging. Um, and um, the slides will be distributed. So Kathy, I think you'll do your wrap up there. Thank you very much, everyone. And thanks to Rachel and Brandon. Thank you to all our presenters today. And yes, I did post the link to that YouTube video is in the chat now. Uh, the link to the slides was also posted and I believe to the um, article as well. All right, well, thanks again to all our presenters. Thanks to everyone for coming out today. If you would like to view this webcast again, it is going to be processed and archived on hr.com probably within 24 hours, it'll be up on site. If you're looking for your webcast credits, they will be in your hr.com account. Also um, within about 24 hours, we'll send out an email with the webcast credits as well. Uh, your feedback is very important to us. Please take a moment and fill out the exit survey that will appear on your screen. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.